unit is final presentation on my study of marine energy. Um, yeah, we're going through it. This is a picture of Coach Mo, not really my project, but very pretty. <laughs> um, everybody should probably go, I haven't gone yet. So, as Lauren said, all of our projects, at least most of ours, took some sort of turn at some point. And so my first part started when I met with uh, Cristiano Escoriaza, my profe, this year, um, in January, actually. And in my initial project, I said I was going to somehow study the whales, put out oceanographic equipment, and measure the currents out there, which is a giant project that needs a lot of money. And need, I didn't have any of those things. And so he offered that we... <laughs> um, he had a connection with this company, Sabella, which is a French company, and he was making this marine energy turbine, and we were able to get the plans. And the idea was to make a smaller uh, 3D model of this and do a present or a investigation in the channel that they have there, an artificial channel. I'll show some pictures. But uh, just get an idea of what this thing is. It's enormous. This uh, diameter here on the blades is 10 meters. There's a boat, there's people. Um, it's a monolithic thing. And there's one, I don't think it's in the water right now, but it was spinning for a year off the coast of France. Um, yeah, this is the turbine that I will be speaking over most of my time. And so. Why do we want to study this in this manner? Um, it, this quote here shows that uh, the main thing we're looking for is basically what we can do with these turbines, where we can put them, and what that means for the, the, the flow around it and the effects around the area. Um, so this is a saying that um, from this paper, which was one of my main resources, that it's actually possible to increase the power output depending on where you put it. Clearly, like if it's into the current or not, going to affect it, depending on whether there's rocks in front of it, but then how you affect the other ones that are nearby it. And so this shows, um, this is one turbine, you can see the change in velocity here, it's the velocity and turbulence intensity, which are both very important to study. This is two, three turbines, and the second line is further down the channel. So you can see how over time it will start returning to higher velocity because the turbines will be taking energy out. So that's the general idea of what we're looking for. Um, and this is the paper I was talking about. I don't know if this was done at Pontificia or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this shows, you can see this part, um, the more orange color is faster flow, more velocity. And you can see there's one turbine here taking energy out. And then here's an array of three and two, and three and two space further away. So you can see how the current's going to be warping around it, getting faster in some places, clearly slower in others. This is the kind of information we are looking for. And so in March I received the plans in AutoCAD, um, which in my experience being a civil, from a civil engineering background is very good in 2D. I have no idea how these engineers made this in 3D because from what I read online in various blogs it's very difficult to make 3D objects in AutoCAD. Um, this one alone you can see all these lines, all these complexities, it's 383 parts. And so my initial goal is to take this monstrosity, break it down into something that I could actually 3D print. This is my first time getting into 3D printing, so I got to learn about how to use that. I was able to use another Autodesk product, which is Inventor, um, free for students, and basically take this, move it over to Inventor, which was theoretically easy. You know, I thought I could just press like export, print, go. <laughs> um, not quite like that. It does have a really nice snap command, so you can like click here, then click here, and it'll tell you exactly the X, Y, and Z, all the distances and everything. But in 3D, it's really hard to get your snap where you want it to because you'll look at it and be like, oh, perfect. Then you rotate the camera and realize that it was like way over here, and that's why it's like 15 meters. And um, So that was a fun challenge. So here's a picture. I forgot to grab my prop before I got here. But, um, this is a pretty picture. Um, that's the final design that came out, out of Inventor here on the left, and then the actual model which is being passed around. This is in Minnesota, and I'll explain why that happened as well. Um, but back to the printing process, my first go at making this model was um, modeling an inventor, so it took some time to get it done, and then took it to the Fab Lab, which is at the Centro de Innovación here at um, San Joaquin, Parte de Pontifici Universidad. And this is the program that you import it in. So even though it's hard to make the model, once you have it, it actually is sort of like import print. It's pretty cool, this program. You just put it in, make sure you tell it the right orientation, make sure it's on the build plate, um, and it runs all the paths, it knows how to draw it, it knows how to support it, um, except for various things like, this is called the raft and the supports, because you can't 
the way this works is it prints. You can see this working here. It'll build the bottom first, and it keeps moving the plate down. So it makes a pass, goes down like a, I don't know, it's like a tenth of a centimeter or something, runs another pass down, down, down. So for this part, you can see the tower there, you can't build something on nothing. And so all of this stuff is called supports, and it's built just to be thrown away later. So you have to learn how to like pick the correct supports and the correct um, settings to make it all, all work out. Um, and here's more parts. You can see this is it building the, uh, the base cone um, here. And you can also see the other setting which is important is the fill. It ends up being, I don't have any parts that are cut up, but it makes a various a hexagonal pattern is what I went for. It's standard. It's what I learned. Because um, you don't actually need it to be full. If that was all 100% full ABS plastic, it'd be very heavy, um, very expensive, time intensive, not necessary because the plastic is so strong, especially for something as small. So you can see here, maybe there's like a hexagonal pattern. It's really fun watching it run along and put out the plastic. Um, and for these parts, I just paid the Fab Lab. Um, I think that model basically cost about 30 Luca. Um, the other challenge I wanted was to get torque control slash velocity control on the spinning blades. And so I was thinking, how am I going to get that? I figured use a motor. How am I going to get a motor to work in water? I found this really fascinating paper that was written by some folks working at MIT. And they built this, uh, an ROV, an underwater self um, remote control vehicle. But it was for kids. It was for like high schoolers to get them into the sciences. And they had this um, plan to pot a motor in wax. And that way you can run the water or the, yeah, water over motor and it still keeps working. So this is actually a, well, it's just epoxy, but this is antifugas. It's like the thing you put your toilet on. And you can just buy that for like a Luca, <laughs> melt it in the microwave. Turns out wax takes a long time to microwave. It's like 10 minutes to get it to melt. Um, yeah, this is the final product. Just pour it in there. And that was actually what led the design on the diameter was, I don't know if we all remember what film used to look like. This is a film canister. <laughs> and uh, so that's what was the diameter of that led the whole design. It's about 100 to 1 to the actual ocean going design. And so that's my first picture of it, and here's it in the flume. You can see the water going by as we filled it up. At um, the same time that I was doing this, I was also auditing one of Christian's classes, and uh, at the end of the semester we got to take a terreno and go up into, this is Agos de Ramon, um, so this is like La Reina right here. Um, walk right by Bachelet's house to get to the park entrance and go all the way up here, and this is actually even further up past a bunch of cows. It's like an hour hike if you're going pretty fast to get out here. And I think your department has like some 10 or 15 different rain gauges out there. Yeah. It's a pretty big network. Not, not all of them are measuring rain, but uh, we have monitored a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Temperature, soil humidity, air humidity, uh, stream flow. And some yeah, exactly. Flow. So this is the stream flow. Um, you can see the whole class here. Um, this is the thing that's there all year round. Um, measuring what the water height is, or actually the air distance, but you know, you can extrapolate. And then you measure the, the cross flow and you can get the flow of the entire river throughout the year and figure out what's happening in the area. Another thing I was doing during this was in the winter, I volunteered with a group called Trabadores del Invierno and we went down to the Araucanía region and uh, built a chanchera and invernadero and each group had a different one. Other groups built a little house for people, um, for the poorer people in this area. And so that was our Thea. She made us lunch every day. And this is the group of, I think we're all pre-grads, except for me. I was the oldest in the group of like 60 people. Um, <laughs> the first in my life. This is us, yeah, digging holes, putting in pilings. And uh, really cold, not a Canadian night, it turns out. But um, this is a picture we got from like two months ago. She already has it all planted and growing. And so I don't know, it was a lot faster turnaround than I expected to see. And it was really cool to see that our efforts already were starting to pay off. Um, then when I got back from that, I found out from again meeting with Christian that um, my coworker Clemente had an opportunity to go to Minnesota to do similar research in their canal at the, uh, what's the name of the college? Is it Twin Falls? No, uh, there's an Twin Falls lab. And St. Anthony Falls. And they have a flume like ours, but much cooler. Instead of just having a big tank of water and recircling it, it actually takes the water out of the river there and puts it to the side, and that's what they measure. And so for that, we wanted to make two more of these turbines and two more that were three times bigger. And so this is me working on the design of the bigger model and looking at 
the problem I ran into, which I hadn't expected, was build volume. The MakerBot, which I'll show you here in a second, has a 25 by 25 by 15 centimeter build volume. So you can't build bigger than that without moving on to a different machine. Three times bigger than that ends up breaking that really, really poorly. And so I had to figure out how to like cut it up, what's intelligent ways to cut it, in order to put it all together later, also get it shipped to Minnesota. And so these were, this is the final version, but this is another idea I had, having a round hole, what height here to cut it at. Um, that's a good idea of what I was building. And so these are the maker bots. We had two there at the, the all of August. I was using every day. Um, this is the program. But what I found out quickly is the boss said it was probably because I bought sort of bunk ABS plastic, but I kept having problems with it quitting right away. Or sometimes it'd be like a 15 hour part, and as you'll see, and it'll quit at like the 14th hour. So I have most of it, and I'll come in in the morning all excited, and then it's just like cut off, and it's not useful. So um, I don't know if you can see, but if you zoom in here, something I found really funny was that even the machines here say full. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you can see how this like program works either the, um, the the temperature of the extruder, which puts out the plastic, and the temperature of the platform as well. Um, and so these are the final examples. So you can see the peso there for um, size. And this is an example of when it, I came back in the morning and it just it stopped there. So now I had to go model a new part to be the nose cone and print another one and put it all together. So that's the one you're seeing there. And my bigger 30 centimeter model by its side, I ended up cutting the nose cone off the back. That one's separate. Each of these plug in, there's six blades, tower is separate, etc. Um, that's me sanding them, and after I got the model, well, I could start getting it uh, printing each one factory style faster. Uh, oh, fast. Um, Another thing I got to do, this was uh, late September, was go speak. It was uh, through Connection of Amanda's with the American Corn in Arica and go present my project and my understanding of the marine energy in, in the world and especially in Chile. So I gave like a 40-minute talk, I believe, there at the University of Tarapaca, along with two other people that talked about these two talks were about solar energy. And so it's an amazing opportunity for me to present in Spanish. It's the first time I spoke Spanish in front of a group. Um, so it was a very, very strong learning opportunity. And after a lot of people came up and asked me questions about, about marine, marine, marine energy and, and grant opportunities. And so it was really cool to reach out to the students there and share what I knew about these opportunities for the future. Another part of my project is when I went down to Chiloé in October and spoke to the fishermen both about my experiences fishing and also just about their understanding of marine energy. And uh, you can see them here. This is actually the control. That guy works for, I can't remember the name, but they work for the government. And they're pulling out a bone that's in the ear. And you can tell the age of the fish off of that. And so that's how they do control of how many of each species they're getting, taking out of the ocean. And these boats will be out off the coast of Chiloé for 40 days at a time sometimes um, until they get the proper quota and aren't allowed to fish anymore. So what I learned from speaking to the fishermen was they don't know anything about marine energy. But they do know about renewables, and a project that's happening very close to Ancud, maybe 20 kilometers on the coast, is the um, Parque Eolica Chiloe. And so they've been trying for some fifth, five years at least to get this big, I think it's 42 wind turbines there on the coast, because there's really powerful wind. And what I found by looking, talking to them and looking at online resources, it's mixed. Some people think it's a very good idea, some people think it's going to... Um, kill all the birds and create a lot of noise pollution. And so there's mixed information on what these, how important that is, but there's a thing called, um, it's like turbine stress, some disorder. And so people think that it just basically makes you very stressed out, gives you anxiety to live near wind turbines. Um, even though there's other, other science that says as long as you know, like 500 meters away, the level is low enough, it's not actually going to be affecting you. But, um, there's other reports I've read that say that the wind turbines are affecting noise enough that the whales don't want to come nearby. And so I don't know which is the bunk science, but it seems like there's a lot of information out there arguing for both sides. And so I, it's just an interesting, something I want to look into in the future is the policy side of marine energy. Because we can make the coolest tools in the world, but if people think that wind turbines are making the whales go away, how are we going to get a marine turbine in the water? Um, I don't think it's going to happen. So I think education and really rigorously looking at what the, the data shows rather than what we feel is going to be important for the future of marine energy and renewables in general. Another part of my volunteering was I taught an English course here, more of a just a chat group, 
at the Instituto Chileno Norteamericano. So this is my group. Sometimes I had six, normally more like four or three. And so another chance to practice, learn Spanish from them, share my English, give back to the community. And among other things, I learned that I'm very bad at drawing a map of the United States. Um, a little bit too big. Texas is not, not doing good in the border there. Um, is this gonna go forward? Yeah, and so coming down to the last month, now that I had the turbine ready, um, I've finally got it in our canal. This is it. It's um, maybe 15 meters long and at a depth of 50 centimeters. Here's the pump. Open it up. Um, and all I had time for, because I started about three weeks ago with the actual investigation, was three distances behind it. The flow is this direction. And nine points, one center line along the sides. And then with the ADV, which I think is the next picture, I had to keep raising this by one centimeter every three minutes. So I spent some eight hours a day sitting there waiting three minutes, move it up one centimeter, press play, one centimeter, press play. Um, but these are being analyzed right now by my coworkers at the uh, Pontificia. And uh, you can see here the height of the center line is some 10 centimeters, the whole thing is 50, um, a high flow of 250 millimeters squared per second. And this is the ADV measuring the flow. Um, that I did. High Reynolds number as well, which is likely to be what you see in a natural environment, something like Canal Chacao, with a lot of turbulence coming from eddies and different sub submarine structures. Um, and so this is uh, information we've gotten that has been analyzed, but not compared to, you know, there's, I think this is just the center line, and there's four points on each side. So we have a lot more data to be collecting and then analyze and see what it means. But as a rough example of, we took one at the front to see what the, without a turbine, what the velocity field looks like. And then at one, two, and three diameters behind the turbine. And as you can see, um, yes, it is taking velocity out of the flow. And it's not really coming back yet at three diameters. So it's much more, like you're not going to be able to put another turbine here without huge impacts in energy. Um, taking, and especially turbulence um, that is put into the blades, which will lead to fatigue, make it fall apart a lot faster. So other studies that I read, didn't have time to replicate, do 20 diameters, which would be another two months of sitting by the canal. So I didn't have time to do that, but depending on what this information shows, it'll show us how to go forward and get the data that we want. So um, since I have this platform, I wanted to speak a moment about our renewables of solution. I think it's a very powerful tool we can use in the future to get us away from other resources that are causing pollution, both locally and globally. Um, but one thing I find really fascinating is it's always looked at as, as a solution. One more thing we can add to our repertoire to be um, more efficient. But it's never spoken about in the larger context of, do we need to always be producing more energy? And so I just, in the future, I'd like to speak more of Yes, making cleaner energy, but also using less energy, which I feel like is never part of when we talk about the science of it. Behavioral change will lead a lot to the ability to, to stop creating so much pollution. So I think it's a two-part attack. Use less, make it cleaner. Um, and with that, yeah, I'd like to thank the Fulbright program for this amazing opportunity. Everybody who supported me, especially Christian and everybody at Pontificia, and uh, especially Chester and Hydraulica for putting up with me for the last couple months. Um, that's what I got. Okay, so we have time for one question, I think. Do you have an idea of the, how much energy this kind of model could potentially produce, or what proportion of the country's energy could eventually come from our main sources? Every, every company has their own numbers for what they can produce. So I had my like presen presentation I had in Arica. Everyone had a megawatt or kilowatt value next to it. So each one's for a different type of area. You know, the, the currents off the East Coast can be different than the West Coast. So you can maybe put in more or less strong um, machines there. So that comes down to comes down to the local hydrology of each location and then what machines you want to put in there. Um, I think it's going to come down a lot more to policy of how many you can get signed off to actually be put in the waters there than what's possible. As far as I can tell, if you have a strong current like somewhere in the south of Chile, it's it could totally run all the cities down there. Um, it'd be harder to do something like Santiago because there's not 
that would have to be more wave, I think, because for for tidal power, you need a constriction, something like Chacao, to actually get the water high enough uh, velocity. But off the coast of Chile, it's all straight. So it'd be more like a, either by wave power, which is something mm. actually is way different than what we're even talking about. This is just tidal. Mm -hmm. um, or there's differences in pressure you can also take energy out of. So I think it's possible to meet large energy demands. I think it's going to be a while till we see it. Um, did I answer it, or is the other more specific? That's good. Yeah, okay, cool. Can I ask a question? Yeah. It's your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, how did you find what the, did you look into the disruption of the marine biology in the, in the area? I didn't really get time to get into yeah. that yet, no. Um, that is a big problem with the noise and electrostatic fields that can be put onto yeah. the water. And Chikau is known for um, one of the largest blue whale migrations. And so I think that'll have a much larger effect on large mammals than smaller right. fish. Um, so no, that is a big problem that needs to be dealt with. And so as I spoke of the, the wind turbines, people are worried that it's going to like kill a couple birds, even though a lot more cats are killing than the birds and wind turbines. And I think the problem actually might be much more magnified in water, yeah. which is why it's taking so long to get it proven in a manner that we can feel good about it being renewable in a way of not harming the environment as well. So, uh, Do you have a better answer about the marine? Yeah, well, yeah, the, it's very complex. And, and at the coastal station uh, where you went, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they, they are studying also the biofouling, which means that mm -hmm. everything you put in the ocean you can get with barnacles and whatever, you know. So uh, there's people studying, in fact, uh, what are the impacts on the marine biology and also the impact of the environment on the turbines because, you know, it's very expensive if you think that you have to maintain something that is 40 meters under the ocean mm -hmm. to take it out, repair it. So the idea is to have something that you can, you can use for a long time without uh, checking it.